Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Contributing to and Benefiting from the Pennsylvania Charitable Food System webinar with PASA. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before we do get started. Um, all of the attendees are currently on mute, and that's just to, to prevent any reverb or, or background noise that, that might be going on. Um, and so we're, we're glad that you're all joining us. If you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and throw them into the Q&A. After each speaker gets a chance to, um, to talk, we'll make sure that we address the questions that we've got, and then we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions as well. So first, a little bit about um, PASA. We are a sustainable agriculture organization based in Pennsylvania, and we are a group of farmers and change makers, and we're cultivating environmentally sound, economically viable, and community-focused farms and food systems. One of the ways that we do that is through educational events like this, and also through our research and apprenticeship program. So we're happy to have you here if it's your first time joining us. And if you're, um, I see a lot of familiar names on the attendee list as well. So welcome back to the folks that, that we know really well. So uh, first I'd like to introduce our speakers. I, I am Christina Kostelecki. I'm the operations director here at PASA and I'll be uh, kind of uh, keeping us on, on track and on time, but I'm very excited to have Karen Long Earl from the D Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, Tom Mainzer from Feeding Pennsylvania and our very own Hannah Smith Brubaker also with Village Acres Farm. So first I'd like to turn it over to Karen Long Earl, the director of Bureau of, at the Bureau of Food and, sorry, the Bureau of Food Assistance at the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And Karen, I'm hopeful that you can tell us a little bit about the programs that PDA offers um, for farmers and the charitable food system. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Christina, for inviting me to be here today. Um, yeah, at the Department of Agriculture, um, we, we have a, a broad mission. Uh, I run our Bureau of Food Assistance, and largely we are charged with helping to connect Pennsylvanians with access to food. Um, we administer the USDA foods programs, which means that we connect um, both uh, over 900 um, school food systems and um, food banks in all 67 counties with food that's sourced from USDA. Um, so we're talking probably in excess of $150 million worth of food every year. Um, we also administer the state food purchase program, which is normally an $18 million program every year. Again, something we administer through all 67 counties. This year, uh, we got an additional $15 million for that program through the CARES Act. Um, largely, the counties um, themselves administer that program and make purchases of that food. Generally, that tends to be a lot of shelf-stable product just because a lot of the um, the local food pantries don't have a lot of refrigeration and freezer capacity, though that is something that we are looking to work on because we know that these locations um, and the people that they serve uh, really do need access to uh, more fresh, healthy product. Not to say that you can't get fresh, healthy product or that you can't get healthy product through shelf stable product, but we recognize that some of that healthier product does come through um, fresh product. Uh, one of the programs I really wanted to highlight for folks on this call today is the um, Senior and WIC Farmers Market Nutrition Program. Pennsylvania is one of the unique states. Um, this is a federal program administered by USDA, but our General Assembly um, is one of the few states that actually matches funding for this program. Our General Assembly annually provides um, $2.079 million for this program. Um, and folks may have heard that this year, our General Assembly was only able to do a, what they call the 512 budget. Um, but for this program, we actually got um, 12 months worth of funding for the program. Um, we generally have about 1,200 Pennsylvania farmers who participate in this program. Uh, farmers who are selling um, Pennsylvania produced um, produce, um, fresh fruits and vegetables are able to participate in this program. So farmers who are either selling product at farmers markets or at their own farm stands are eligible to participate. 
um, each eligible senior or each eligible WIC recipient receives four $6 vouchers for a total of $24, and they can go redeem these vouchers. Um, the program runs June through November, so we're about to wrap the program up this year, and we're not accepting new farmers for this year, but um, we will be accepting farmers for the program next year. So if you are not already participating in that program, I would encourage you to look into the program because it's a great way to help connect low-income people with um, your product and uh, all the, the dollars from those vouchers go back into your pockets. So it's a great win-win um, to be able to support Pennsylvania agriculture. And then of course the other program that we're here to talk about today is the Pennsylvania Agricultural Surplus System. This was a program that was established in law probably about 10 years ago, um, but it never had the funding until Governor Wolf came into office. Uh, so the program has been in existence now and funded for the past six years. Um, it received a million dollars per year for the first three years of the program. The um, second three years of it received a million and a half dollars. Um, again, this was a program that was fortunate to receive additional funding through CARES funding, um, an additional $10 million through CARES funding that I believe Tom is going to talk about here in a minute. Um, but we, again, have been really fortunate with this program. Um, as the Secretary of Agriculture talks about it, it's really a dual purpose program. It's helping us to put healthy Pennsylvania produced product into the hands of low income Pennsylvanians, but it's also helping us to support Pennsylvania's agricultural industry, um, largely helping us to um, support farmers who may have excess product, who might not have a home for product, but the product is uh, healthy and safe product and, um, you know, helping to reimburse them for some of their costs and getting the food in hands of people who need it. So we are really excited about this program. Um, we would like to be able to expand this program um, to all 67 counties to date um, through September. We have sourced nearly 13 million pounds worth of product through this program. Um, probably about three quarters of it has been uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. We've also been able to get dairy products, um, protein products, including um, eggs, cheeses, meats, um, but we know that we can do more and um, that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, but happy if folks have questions about either how to um, participate in these programs as a farmer or how to receive benefits from these programs. Um, happy to get, um, have folks reach out to me for additional information. And I see um, the question if there's anything like this in New Jersey. New Jersey does have the Farmers Market Nutrition Program. Um, I'm not sure if New Jersey is doing anything with um, similar to the past program, but in the 2018 Farm Bill, Congress did put in the, um, gosh, I'm blanking on what it's called. The, uh, Tom, help me out here. Um, USDA Farm to Food Bank Program. Thank you, <laughs> the USDA Farm to Food Bank Program, which is modeled after the past program. And if states put in a plan with USDA, um, they can access some of the funding that was put in for that. Um, so it, certainly if New Jersey is interested, uh, always happy to be a resource to um, help them get something started. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, we also had one other question. Um, uh, it looks like this is related to the um, Senior and WIC Farmers Market Nutrition Program. The question is, do the farmers apply and how do the seniors get the vouchers? Sure. So um, the farmers apply through the Department of Agriculture to participate in the program. Uh, we would then send one of our field reps out to do a review of the farm. Uh, we would set them up with the stamp that they would need to be able to receive the vouchers. They would then just take them to the bank and deposit them like normal checks. Um, for the WIC recipients, they receive them through their normal um, WIC visits. For the seniors, they're distributed through uh, the senior agencies on aging. Um, typically, they are distributed through in-person distributions. This year was a little bit more challenging. They advertise them in the newspapers. A lot of times they either had to call, um, email, send mail um, to be able to get the vouchers. So uh, we don't have results for this year's redemption yet because I, I do think it was a challenging year for the program. Um, but generally, seniors would go to a distribution to be able to get the vouchers. Great, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. 
Again, if, if any attendees have questions, feel free to put them into the Q&A. Um, you can also chat us. It's just uh, a little harder for us to scroll through them, but you're totally welcome to do that. So next, I would love to introduce Tom. Uh, uh, to talk a little bit about Feeding Pennsylvania and more specifically about the PASS program. All right, thank you, Christina, and uh, thanks for uh, setting up this webinar and a chance to join Karen and Hannah to talk about these programs. Uh, Feeding Pennsylvania, uh, we have nine member food banks that service all 67 counties across the Commonwealth. Uh, our goal is to promote and aid uh, food banks to secure food and other resources to help reduce hunger and food insecurity across Pennsylvania. Um, Feeding PA also is a shared voice on hunger and food access issues um, across the Commonwealth and, and with, uh, within Harrisburg as well. Uh, the, you know, we have our nine member food banks uh, work with 2,700 distribution agencies across the state. Uh, those include um, local uh, agencies like soup kitchens and pa food pantries and uh, th that service a more local focused area. They distributed 164 million pounds of food annually and in uh, 2019. And on a regular basis, over 2 million Pennsylvanians are served each year. Uh, the Charitable Food Network has seen an incredible rise during the COVID-19 pandemic and in the accompanying uh, economic downturn. Uh, feeding PA member food banks have reported significant increases for food assistance, with an average 65% increase in demand. Uh, to put it in perspective, um, Annually, we serve about 2 million individuals a year. During the first three months of the COVID crisis, 5.5 million Pennsylvanians were served um, through our nine member food banks. Uh, so we have been doing our best to um, meet the demand. Uh, we're working with a variety of uh, Pennsylvania and federal programs, uh, the CARES programs which is Corona, um, I apologize, I don't remember what CARE stands for at this point, uh, but it, it's coronavirus related uh, relief packages. Um, like Karen mentioned, we received 10 million additional dollars um, to purchase Pennsylvania products for the food banks. Five million was set aside for dairy and five million for other food and agricultural products such as produce, meat, and eggs. Thank you, Christina. Um, coronavirus aid relief and economic security. Um, there's been other CARES programs to the county level that have uh, gone directly to food banks to assist their efforts, including uh, increasing storage capacity and uh, some CARES programs through PBA that have uh, directly benefited farmers in their efforts um, and their challenges during the coronavirus. Um, Feeding Pennsylvania also has some other programs that we work with. The Healthy Pantry Initiative uh, partners with member food banks to increase healthy food and beverage options. They work with nutrition educators, um, healthy food tastings, demonstrations, recipes um, to encourage healthier eating habits uh, among those um, that get food from the charitable food system. Uh, we also, within Feeding Pennsylvania, have the Mid-Atlantic Regional Cooperative, uh, which is a regional produce distribution serving our Feeding America partner food banks uh, from New England all the way down to Virginia, uh, 23 participating food banks. Um, and they distribute about 1.5 million pounds of produce each month. Um, and then last but not least, the USDA Farm to Food Bank Program and the PASS Program, which Karen had mentioned earlier. Um, through these, we work to get more Pennsylvania food and ag products into the food bank system. Uh, so, as I mentioned, each year, uh, 2 million uh, Pennsylvanians are served and they struggle with hunger every day. 
the Pennsylvania Ag Plus Agricultural Surplus System, the PASS program. Uh, Feeding PA is the statewide contractor for PASS, and we partner with our nine Feeding PA food banks and four uh, additional partners to serve all 67 counties in PA. Uh, using the state food purchase program formula, um, so there's an equitable distribution among all 67 counties. Uh, past funds are used to procure only local Pennsylvania products uh, and with one purpose to reduce surplus product or waste from farms and from food companies. Uh, the PASS program is usually seen as one of the more um, healthy programs among food banks because it is focused on fresher product, dairy products, whether it's fluid milk, cheese, uh, butter, cottage cheese, yogurt, um, produce, fru fruits and vegetables, uh, meat products, and eggs, uh, so lots of protein options. Uh, food banks, you know, they all receive product from national companies, but they rely on PASS to forge relationships and procure more local products. Uh, funding has held steady at 1.5 million since 2017, as Karen mentioned. Uh, but COVID has revealed the frailty of the fra how frail the food system is and how resilient are both our agriculture community and those serving uh, Pennsylvanians in need. Uh, so this year, uh, Feeding PA is working with PDA and the legislator, legislature to request $5 million for 2021-2022 fiscal year, uh, which would start next July. Uh, so we're hoping to see an increase um, and would help meet more demand and support local farms and producers. And so for those participating in the PASS program, as you can see on that slide, uh, eligible costs include uh, harvesting or any costs associated with uh, labor to get product from the field um, in, in, into packaging or bins or, or, or into processing, like for dairy products. And then also any transportation costs that would be associated getting it from uh, where either value is added or from the farm to the food bank. Uh, so I, the PASS program, we kind of get our products from three main areas. Um, most contributions are probably the surplus at harvest. So when um, a farmer or producer has extra product remaining, uh, we work with their regional food bank to determine the need. Um, it, product doesn't have to be necessarily the top grade, uh, but it does need to be in good condition. So food banks really like those, those ugly fruits and vegetables where there's you know, absolutely nothing wrong with them. They're still, um, still taste great and highly nutritious, but maybe they don't look good on the at Giant in the produce section, well, they're still great uh, for, the, for the food banks. Um, you know, PASS has worked with 150 producers uh, over the last six years, and uh, from 47 of the 67 counties, and we'd really love to hit those last 20 counties to get producers involved with their regional food bank or local distribution agencies. Uh, we know that they're, they're out there, uh, but we'd like to help them um, with their costs and get involved in the PASS program as well. Um, the food banks also use PASS funds for those value-added products, um, meat, eggs, and pretty much any dairy product falls in there. Uh, we, um, you know, even fluid milk, we'd, we'd count that as value-added. Um, but the cost can be used to procure those Pennsylvania products for the food banks. And then contract planning is something that we're, uh, there, there's been some work with that in the past with PASS, uh, but we're looking to get a little more involved and get more participants and try to be a little more proactive uh, with PASS. Um, it helps with planning both on the food bank side and with the producer as well. All right. 
Uh, thank you, Christina. And if any questions come up, please put them in the uh, Q and A, and I'm glad to help either during or at the end. Um, producers and food banks work together through the contract planning program to plan for availability. Um, you know, this might be about that time. This November to January, as um, Hannah had mentioned to me, is you may be planning out buying seeds or what you're going to plant. So if you're interested in participating, please feel free to reach out and we can loop in the regional food bank and determine what products uh, they may be interested in. Um, and then the food banks can let you know what they're looking for and that um, can be planned ahead for production. Uh, for example, like in the fall, um, there's always a lot of hard squash available. Uh, so there's overabundance of hard squash. Um, but maybe if we work together with the food banks and there may be, for example, they may need more corn, uh, maybe we could switch over a small portion of uh, acreage or a portion of an acre for, for corn instead of hard squash, as an example. Uh, the contract planning program would be a commitment to use the past funds uh, once the product is ready and the condition is approved um, upon delivery. Uh, it allows food banks the lead time to receive product and uh, plan out distribution to their agencies, as well as making sure funds are set aside for the purchase. Um, you know, this is a, a still a new program. Everybody's kind of been working on it uh, individually. So we look forward to working with new participants uh, kind and uh, ironing out the details um, as we work together with producers and food banks and get, um, you know, nutritious Pennsylvania products to our neighbors in need. Uh, there's no cost to participate. Um, the information to get involved would be, you know, fairly standard, um, your business contact info, contact person and phone number and or email, uh, maybe a W-9 form, uh, just to know uh, the type of business um, so that we can uh, process payment. So that process, payment can be processed, um, you know, once we get to that point. Um, if you're interested in participating, please let me know. Like I said, we can, or we can contact the food bank directly to work out details. Um, details that would be discussed would be the product that may be needed by the food bank, uh, and agreeing on a price, um, discussing the transportation, if it's something that, um, that the producer may be able to bring to the food bank or distribution agency, we'd make sure to set aside a uh, transportation cost as well as for the funds so that they're available. And um, any packaging costs, for example, if it's uh, potatoes and they may go in five pound bags, we'd, we keep that in mind as well, because that can be covered. Um, let's see, you know, delivery details. Once the product is ready, we'd follow up with uh, both the producer and the food bank to coordinate um, a time and location and a date. And then once all the condition of the product is approved, um, you know, the payment would be processed. So that's kind of the framework of how everything would work. Um, you know, we're willing, I know food banks, some food banks have some specifics they want to work out. So as we discuss early, anyone that may be interested, we can always um, cover any granular details that come up. Uh, this is uh, the map of our regional food banks. Uh, for the past program, we work with 13 uh, that cover all of the counties. So um, wherever your business or farm is located, um, we can reach out to the food bank in that corresponding region. Uh, this is also on, I believe, on the PDA website and on the Feeding Pennsylvania website. Uh, so we can provide more information as to uh, the direct contacts. Or of course, you can always contact me and we can uh, sort out where to, where to get started. Um, thank you so much. That's, that's really helpful information. 
Thank you. Uh, so we had a, a question come through. Uh, do farmers have to have a USDA farm number to participate in the PASS program? I don't believe so. Um, no, Karen's also nodding. Um, no, I'm, I, you wouldn't need a, a USDA farm number. Um, you know, we, we haven't had that requirement yet. Thank you. Uh, and again, you can you can put any questions into the chat or the Q and A, and we'll we'll come back to them um, as we've got some time. So we've heard kind of the overview and some of the specifics about how to participate, but we also wanted to talk to um, a farmer who who has participated and who has donated through the past program. And there's. Um, uh, you know, a, a plethora of folks like Tom mentioned, there's a whole list of, of farms who have participated, but we have uh, one in house that was really easy to, to talk to. So <laughs> we'd love to invite Hannah Smith Brubaker, who uh, is the co owner of Village Acres Farm and Food Shed, and also our executive director here at BASA. Hannah, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> um, I did see one other question come in for Tom and that's whether or not farms have to be GAP certified. And as a farmer who's not GAP certified and is donating, I can assume that is no. Um, that's correct. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I encourage everyone to be GAP certified. We're, we're working on that ourselves, but it's not required. I see that Christina has surprised us with some photos from, from my farm. This, uh, this chicken wanted to get in the way of my picture of the blue sky we had, we had recently. So um, we have had a really great experience, um, not only with PASS, but the FMNP program as well. We do accept FMNP vouchers at the um, farmer's market in our town. And um, I wish that more, I wish we could really get more people to participate in that program because it's really easy. Literally the customer gives you the voucher, you stamp it, you put it in the bank, just like you would a check. So I highly encourage people to get registered for that in the coming season. Uh, some of the ways that we've participated in past, um, we have, for example, called and said, you know, we have 300 pints of cherry tomatoes and they're perfectly fine right now. Um, there's no way that our local food pantry could handle 300 pints <laughs> of, of cherry tomatoes. And so um, we've been able to move those through pass and in that situation we received money for the pint tills for the labor costs to harvest and pack. Um, we often have moved eggs through um, pass so you know those of us who have laying hens we have particularly <clears throat> if you've got pasture based systems and you're balancing in terms of having your main flock still laying and your replacement flock is just coming into laying and you've got overages that maybe you don't quite have your market set up for yet. Um, in that case, we um, you know, might call and say, we've got 350 dozen eggs. And in that situation, we actually have gotten money for the cartons and the labor costs for collecting and packing but also depending on the demand for something like eggs, a nominal amount of money, I believe through a separate um, from the food bank for the eggs themselves, if they happen, it happens to be a product that they're actually wanting to purchase as well. Um, mostly the things we've moved like mixed vegetables or um, if we have seconds of something, we aren't asking for or receiving any money for the product itself, just for the labor and the packing costs. Um, for us, we sort of, at first I was a little bit um, leery because I thought, oh gosh, will this replace the donations we're already making to our local pantry? And what we found is our, helps us make the decision is, is it more than what our local pantry can handle at the time? 
And is it something that really we're making a decision between can we even afford to harvest it? <laughs> so when we think about those things, we kind of decide, or is this something we're just taking to the local pantry to drop off or we're gonna um, participate in pass for those products? We're very fortunate because we live maybe a mile and a half from the Juniata County um, food pantry. And so what we do is when Central Pennsylvania Food Bank comes to make a delivery to the pantry, they just swing by our farm, pick up the product and take it back with them. So if you do live fairly close to um, a food bank or food pantry, it it can be really helpful to sort of coordinate that so that you don't have to provide transportation. Um, uh, let's see, some of the other related ways that we occasionally have been able to help or have been thinking about helping is, you know, we have a lot of walk-in cooler space on our farm that depending on the time of year, we might have extra space. So when Tom talked about well, maybe the food pantry doesn't have the capacity for all of your squash right now. <laughs> um, if we know that it's something that they're going to be needing in the next few months, we can actually store the product on the farm um, knowing that they'll be ready for it um, shortly. Of course, you know, we, we're actually considering planting a field or two for the coming season. And one of the things that we really care about at our farm is providing culturally appropriate foods for communities. And so we're looking forward to talking with um, Tom about sort of what are the things that he thinks might be um, in high demand that aren't always very available through the charitable food system. Then of course, there's just the general donating of, of product participating in PASS and FMNP. And um, the one thing I was a little bit nervous about at first was the whole discussing the, the price <laughs> piece of it, because I thought, oh gosh, well, I know I don't want to say too much. I, you know, I, I know compared obviously to what we're getting for retail because our farm sells almost exclusively directly to customer. So, um, Although we do sell wholesale as well, most of it is direct to customer. <clears throat> and so what helped us is we just figured out what, what really did it cost us to, um, to grow, harvest, pack, and package that product and um, just use that as a baseline and then sort of negotiate from there you know, is there a way that we could at least just cover our costs? Um, and generally that's been pretty close to what the, the, the um, program has been willing to or able to cover. Thanks so, so that, much, Anna. That's it for us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that, that's really, really helpful information. So we, um, there was a, a great story, sort of a couple of things prompted this webinar. One was uh, Deputy Secretary Cheryl Cook from PDA uh, was on another webinar of ours and said, you know, you all should really talk more about the, the past program. And then also uh, uh, several weeks ago, we got an, uh, a call from an individual who said, I've got um, surplus milk or cream and it's too much for the typical consumer, but not enough to go on a milk truck. Right. And so I said, you should really reach out to pass and see about donating that product. And the individual said, yeah, that's great, but I can't take a loss on this. Right. I've got to, you know, milk producers are already in such a precarious state. And I said, well, that's the really great news is that pass is here to make sure that you're not taking a loss on this, that you're able to, you know, recover that transportation and the, the, um, um, processing costs. And so they, um, I connected them with, with Tom and in a matter of four or five days, that product had been um, processed. And I think Tom, if I'm right, it was turned into butter and delivered to um, like several, a, a lot of butter <laughs> that was donated to the food system. Yeah, that's correct. It, uh, 
it was in the central PA region and, and it ended up getting um, going to another dairy processor to convert to butter. It went to central PA. Um, the, the cost covered the cost of the cream and um, I don't remember the vessel, but it was some um, type of uh, packaging for the cream to get it to the processor. So it wasn't like a final box or presentation, but it covered the packaging and the transport and like the break even cost of the cream. So there was no loss on behalf of that individual that typically makes yogurt. Um, but then we were also able to, for the cost uh, of the conversion to butter and uh, it ended up getting donated uh, through Harrisburg. Yeah, so I, I love that story because it showcases, you know, Hannah talked about eggs and vegetables, but um, you all also handle meats and, and dairy products. And I think that it really does help service the, the entire, um, the, the whole food spectrum, the, all of the needs of, of individuals. I'll also offer this piece up with the caveat that I am no tax expert. Um, but with the past program, um, if you are donating the product and getting reimbursed for the cost of production, transportation, et cetera, um, there is the federal charitable tax deduction for donation of food. And um, you could certainly talk to um, your tax accountant too to find out um, if you could also claim a portion of it for a tax deduction too. Um, and several years ago, I do know that they changed the tax laws because um, those who did cash accounting were not able to take advantage of this, but it was changed so that um, those entities, which I know a lot of smaller farmers do the cash accounting method, are now able to take advantage of it. Again, not a tax expert, so that's probably the extent of my knowledge on it, uh, but did want to mention it is something um, you know, to look into um, if you're interested in participating in this program as well. Thank you, Karen. Uh, one other thing uh, I just wanted to clarify, um, with, which I think was touched upon a couple times with uh, Hannah's presentation, is really a, there's no right or wrong quantity either. Um, you know, if it's a, if you have a small quantity like a couple bushels or one bin, uh, we can try to find an appropriate um, distribution agency or or food bank to to see if they can take that small of a quantity. Um, and then if, if you have like a lot for some reason, we, we can reach out to the regional food bank to see if they have a plan for um, quantities that are large. So we can be flexible. It can be, um, you know, pints of, of cherry tomatoes or, or it could be bins of watermelons or something. So it, it, it can be flexible in terms of quantity as well. Thank you. We've got a question that came in. Our local food pantry only accepts canned food or shelf-stable food. Who should I contact instead? Yeah. Yeah, please uh, let me know. Uh, you can reach out to me via email or phone and uh, we can go up to the regional food bank, um, which covers your county and um, there may be another pantry or distribution agency uh, within your county that might accept fresh food, um, or it might be a little bit more of a transport away, but we can work with them. And if it comes down to logistics, we can try to figure that out and, and find another location that might accept that product. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions from folks? What, I guess I, I have a question about what are some of the products that you wish farmers would grow? <laughs> um, well, we, uh, I, I think it, it's a lot, I'd say more fruits. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we get an abundance of apples. Uh, pretty much every food bank has a regional or, or larger partner that does apples, but certainly any other fruits. I know they're, they're typically higher in value, um, but we do have funds set aside for that. If fruit can 
come through. Fruits also can be a challenge uh, because of shelf life. Mm -hmm. So maybe those with a little, um, that are a little more sturdy. Um, other vegetables um, that can be moved. Um, I know there's a lot of, there's a lot that goes into the process um, for transport and storage. Um, you know, but we get a lot of those that are hardy, the, the squashes and the potatoes and the apples. Um, so if we can work together on those that, um, you know, that are, that can be moved just in time, uh, that might be an option for, for the PASS program. Mm -hmm. And if, um, if we have, for example, um, cut salad greens, is it preferable to bag those, like portion them before we get them to you? Or could we send, you know, um, bins of cut salad greens to be portioned? Uh, I would, at this point in time, uh, I would let me know and we can check with the food bank. Okay. I would say, I mean, though, this time last year, from my understanding, you know, that everybody had a lot more flexibility with volunteers and mm -hmm. uh, low touch oh, yeah. mm -hmm. wasn't so much of a challenge as it is now. So some food banks have been more willing to, you know, pass the cost on to, to you to bag it and then they receive the bags. And hopefully as things loosen up a little bit with COVID and precautions and, and food safety, that may change. So I'd say reach out first and check. Okay. Uh, but it could be flexible, it could go either way. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it depends on the food bank. Um, I know, you know, for instance, um, you know, kind of pre-COVID, Central Pennsylvania Food Bank, uh, one day a week, normally their um, volunteers were doing nothing but, um, you know, packaging apples. They would get bulk donations of apples and volunteers would be packaging them into like, you know, two or three pound bags. Um, so, I mean, definitely, you know, salad greens is something that they normally would be able to do. I think, you know, COVID has just kind of shifted things a little bit in terms of volunteers. Um, the other thing, I think it's a great question, Hannah, um, about the types of products. I, I think it's something we probably could survey the food banks to ask, are there things that you would like to see more of? And particularly, I, I think to your point about maybe trying to plant some more culturally sensitive um, products, I think that's a great question that we can survey and see, you know, are there things that your clients are asking for that um, you know, we can pass along to the agricultural community to say, hey, if you have these things or if you're thinking about um, you know, doing some intentional planning. These are the types of things we're looking for. So thank you for that question and that it's planting something in my mind that we need to do. Yeah, I mean, I can even see the advantage for a farmer who, let's say I'm trying to decide whether growing ground cherries for, you know, a potential new market is something I want to start doing, well, maybe I can, whatever that culturally, you know, appropriate crop is, maybe I'm going to grow that for one year through pass, knowing that it, my risk is lowered a little bit. Um, of course, I would want it to be something that there's demand for, um, you know, through the charitable system, but it could also be a way for me to take a little bit lower financial risk to experiment with a new crop before I really dive in to yeah, no, definitely. I think, um, and I'll talk to Tom and Jane about it too, that we can, we can definitely do a survey um, to see what clients are asking for as well. Okay, because we could even, if we knew what those products were, PASA would be more than happy to put a call out to our farmers and say, hey, if you have any interest in actually planting a little extra of, you know, these five crops this year, let's all together now, um, participate and pass that way by us all sort of collaborating around those products. I love it. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Yeah, let me um, move on to another question that came in here. Can you give some examples of products that have been contract growing using PASS? So how do you handle, for example, unexpected crop issues or potential changes in the demand or the need of the, on the food bank side? Right, thank you. And I'd say from the examples I've um, had and heard of in the past, it's been, um, I think some leafy greens have been um, planned ahead various types of lettuce and cabbage and such. Uh, they've been fortunate to not have issues. Um, but if, if something does come up, the, well, the demand hopefully wouldn't change too drastically over the course of a season. Um, you know, the, the order would be based on expected demand. Um, you know, if there's a crop issue, uh, you know, the, product would just unfortunately not get delivered. Um, it wouldn't be paid for. There would be no loss. Um, but, you know, unexpected crop issues, it, they're hard to plan for in general. Um, if, if, the, if they don't get delivered and we can find, you know, another outlet to service that need later in regards to the food bank, we can try, you know, looking for other producers. But those that are involved in the in the contract growing, you know, we just kind of try to keep the lines of communication open. And if um, they don't may not be able to deliver once the product was expected to be ready, we can, um, you know, try to figure something out elsewhere. It is a it is an interesting question in that what if a farmer were to commit to grow something and they do prepare the field, plant it, grow it, and like right before harvest, there's a storm. <laughs> so they've put the cost of growing that product into it already, but then there's no deliverable product. I'd be curious to know sort of what would happen that, in that situation. Yeah, I mean, we have to... <laughs> That's that's a great question. Yeah, uh, I don't know. It's just something to think about. Probably address that case by case. You know, we can reimburse when product is delivered. Um, we'd like yeah, to my my thought on it is that you know, if I mean, you know, that we we can't reimburse for product that's not there. So unfortunately, that's a loss to the producer. However, if the producer has something else um you know say they planted corn that they were intending to donate and you know the corn wasn't viable but they had an excess of green beans and peppers that could um, be donated to the program um i mean certainly you know we could take other product other than what they intended to put into it that doesn't mitigate the loss for that product but um, it wouldn't totally cut that that producer off from just being in the program. I, I know that's not an ideal answer, but I think that's probably the, the best option we have. I, and thank you all. I, I really appreciate that um, the past program is trying to um, help meet some of those ebbs and you know, kind of even out the demand on products and the availability for the charitable food system, but also making this a little bit easier for farmers instead of only being able to react to surplus, being able to kind of plan ahead. And, and um, again, you're, you're starting to think about your planning for next season now. So now's a really great time to reach out to, to Tom and find out what are some of the needs? What are some of the things that I could supplement? Could I add an extra half a row um, or, or an extra row specifically for the charitable food system? And to me, the really great part is that you can cover some of those basic costs, but also give back in this time that has been incredibly difficult, both for farmers, but also you know that demand on the charitable food system has so hugely increased. And we talked about the, the title of this webinar is, contributing to and benefiting from the charitable food system. And we know, you know, even a lot of farmers are needing to reach out to their local food banks. And so we're, 
we're glad that we're able to, to make these connections and help help the charitable food system in a number of different ways, but also help farmers um, kind of figure out what to do with some of that surplus without taking a, a complete loss on that. So we're really thankful that PDA and Feeding Pennsylvania in the past program is here and is really listening to the needs of farmers and trying to, to help meet that demand. Christina, I'll just add, if there are farmers that are in need of food assistance, um, there is no shame in reaching out. Please um, reach out to me, um, reach out to our department. Um, we can put you in contact with your local food bank. We can put you in contact with our partners at Department of Human Services who administer the um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. If you have children, we can put you in touch with Department of um, Health who administers the WIC program. There are resources out there, and um, just because you are growing food doesn't mean you may not also be in need of food assistance, um, and certainly more than happy to provide assistance to anyone in Pennsylvania who is in need. Um, we've seen, on average, um, a 55% increase across the state in need for food assistance. Um, you know, people who never thought that they would need to reach out for food assistance before, so um, there's absolutely no shame in reaching out for help, and we are here. Um, legitimately. It's it's not the cliche of we're the government, we're here to help. We are legitimately here to help if folks are in need. So please reach out. Thank you so much for that. Um, I don't see any other specific questions. We did have one before the webinar started asking, and I think you touched on this a little bit, Tom, but they were asking about the specific kinds of questions that would be required on that on, for the registration information for a farmer wanting to participate in this program. So can you kind of talk through just like someone picks up the phone and calls you, what are some of the next steps? What are some of the questions that, that you ask that they ask? I mean, sure. In, in terms of, um, you know, business info, certainly just the basics. Um, contact info, um, address, uh, name and phone number, email. Um, we just need to know the location. That's one, probably the first thing to get us started because then we can figure out which food bank they would fall under so we can work uh, within the, the charitable food network and pick the right partner. I mean, from there, questions I would ask are, you know, product they would be interested in, um, you know, donating or working with on us with. If they have product available right away, certainly the quantities and, um, you know, if, if they would need help with transportation or, or they can provide transportation, if it's just, you know, a small order that might be able to go to a food distribution agency within their county. Um, you know, pretty, pretty, what I would say is pretty basic. And then of course, they usually have some additional, more granular questions that we can help answer at that time. But in terms of required info, try to keep it pretty basic in, in terms of, um, you know, how they would like to participate. Thanks, Tom. And I'll just go back to that example of the individual who um, called us a few weeks ago. Um, they, you know, had never participated with the past program or done any donations before. And when I followed up with them, they said it was an incredibly easy process and, um, and, and as easy as a couple of phone calls and that the product was donated in less than a week and everything was wrapped up and, and very simple from their end. So as a farmer, if you're worried about the burden on your side of it, I think um, Hannah can also speak to, to um, you know, how much of a lift this is. And from the farmers that I've talked to, it's, it's not a heavy burden. Sorry, I just wanted to just say that um, to echo uh, Christina's comments, we really appreciate you joining us today and PASA is thrilled to be able to spread the word about the program. Yeah, uh, special thanks to our presenters, Tom and Karen and Hannah. Um, 
helping us give a really well-rounded view of the charitable food system and specifically that past program. And I do hope that if you're uh, an attendee, either a farmer or someone who is in close contact with a farmer and you hear about surplus that you pass along the information and help them connect. Um, if you can't remember it, feel free to reach out to us at PASA. We're always here to help make these connections. And um, we will uh, look forward to seeing you all and, and hearing about these connections. Also, if you have any really good stories about working with the charitable food system, please let us know. Those stories are really helpful um, to, to be able to pass along to other farmers and to showcase the, the strength of the system. Thank you all for joining us and uh, we'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks everyone. Thanks.